Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Coaches and Content. I'm your host, Zach Scholl. We have a very special guest today, someone who I admire a lot. He's a pro wrestler, a businessman, entrepreneur. Uh, what do you say, international wanted bad guy? <laughs> That's right. Well, wanted in many countries, but they can't stop me. I'm glad to be back here in the coaches' content to break it all down with you, Coach Shul. Uh, everybody, take a lap, do or do 10 push ups, whatever you got here. Let's get your heart rate up. The bad guys in the house, Bin Hameen, Hameen Media Group, you guys. Good to be here. So, guys, we have the world famous Bin Hameen here. He's a pro wrestler. He has his own podcasting empire. He's a super interesting story, super interesting life, super interesting guy. I've uh, been a fan of his for about four or five years, so I reached out, and he was gracious enough to spare me 30 minutes. So, Ben, how are you doing today? Oh, good, man. It'll be tough to cover in 30 minutes, so we better get right to it. But I uh, appreciate all your loyal listening and uh, interactive in the Hami Media Group community, man. You've uh, definitely been uh, a key player in uh, keeping conversations going and, and offering uh, a good laugh here and there as well. But I was pumped to see that you're making this kind of content. So uh, that's the least I can do for uh, someone who's been so loyal to helping my brand grow. And hopefully we can inspire some people today uh, to, to believe in whatever they want to make happen, man, because you can. It just takes all of the chop wood, carry water, 10,000 hour rule mentality. And, uh, and if it's something you love, you can make it happen. There's no doubt. Man, you say that phrase all the time. I never heard it before you said it, but I love that phrase, the uh, chop wood and carry water. Where, where did yeah. you get that from? Uh, my grandfather. <laughs> and it's, it's an older phrase that just, you know, means do the hard work. Uh, like, <laughs> and it, like we have uh hunting camps deep in the woods and there's a, uh, a beautiful creek, Golden Dribble Lodge, <laughs> uh, and you have to go up about uh, a 70 degree hill carrying five gallon buckets of water in each arm. It's very karate kid training like, you know, and and then if you've ever chopped wood, you know that it's it's no joke. So chop and stack wood so you can stay warm and have some water so you can make your stew and eat and and have all your you know, washing and whatever you need done. Like, uh, it's gotta be done. Those tasks are fundamental to survival. And if you are willing to put in the work, you'll reap the rewards of it. So, uh, you've got to have that hard work ethic mentality because the world meets nobody halfway a little over the top for you right there. Like uh, you've got to just go for it yourself. Uh, and a lot of people are since post COVID era, it's been, uh, inspiring, especially with shows like this and, and what people's, passions are being turned into business wise. I th it's all exciting, man. Like right now in New York, the cannabis industry uh, with everything is booming and I have an ownership and a part new business here. Uh, and it's just like the wild west right now. And every day it's another headache, but when you conquer it, you're like, yeah, now next step, what's the next coach put another hit and dummy in front of me. I'm going to knock it down. Ah. And you're just like, every little sale you make every inch forward you you can make and cover that ground in a football kind of mentality you you hold on to it with everything you don't want to go backwards and sometimes you get knocked on your butt and hopefully you got good people on your team to help lift you up and if you don't then you just got to get up dust yourself off chop wood carry water some more nobody's going to make nobody's going to do this for me i got to do it let's do this and you just get pumped and then i'm also a big proponent of the best will always find each other. So if you put yourself in the highest circles of whatever it is, your passion is, you are going to learn from other people who have more experience and become your mentors. And you're going to, you know, find your way as well and find your voice. And then you want to pass it on to the next generation as well. So you need to put yourself in the place where the greats are that you want to be respected by. And then you have to do the work to get there and, Usually that takes three to five years in any master craft. If I could quote Vince Russo right now, I'd say, bro, like just to, we're only five minutes in already and you already dropped so many gems. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, like I if more, you know, cause I think that way too. And I think that's why I love listening to you talk. And I think that if more people had that work ethic, you know, they could accomplish anything they want. I just, you know, I guess we get in our own way or, whatever it may be, but I think more people need to have that mentality. Well, my, I, that's really my father. And, uh, my dad is a, a man amongst men and 
is a humble guy who doesn't want any praise. I look <laughs> a lot like a younger version of him now. And he was uh, uh, more of an athlete where I was a theater kid. And now I do the fake athlete shit, but uh, oh, sorry. I don't hope. Uh, oh yeah. 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 You're fine. Yeah. All right. We're in the locker room coaches have been toughen up. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, but, uh, he's, he was a, a forester lumberjack, you know, farm boy, small town boy. And I, I went the other way and went out to the cities in Chicago and Louisville and, and lived there and really pursued my art, but with the passion that, and work ethic that he would instill in me. And he wanted me to have <laughs> crappy jobs. So I would learn how to work hard. So I would appreciate working smart. You know, doing graphics at, at, for <clears throat> Nestle ice cream for 45 bucks an hour. That's that's easy. <laughs> like after you've worked on the Department of Works tree crew and the road crew, where you're shoveling dead skunks at six in the morning off the road and you're doing blacktop all day and you got a foreman smoking Winston heavies blowing them up in the truck, bro. <laughs> You're just like, I got to get out of here. I don't want this to be the next 30 years of my life. Shout out to those guys on DPW crews. I got mad respect for them because I've done that job for two, three summers. But at the same time, when I, when I'm in Chicago on the 30th floor working for DDB tribal on a Chevy campaign, <laughs> it was, it was like, wow we made it somewhere. We made something happen the right way. You know what I mean? So, and then those nights I would be at improv Olympic five, six nights a week, either performing or having multiple shows at smaller theaters and taking classes and, and you know, live two blocks from Wrigley field. And it's just like a, such a incredible time uh, after college to like really go for it and, and live that lifestyle. And, and I brought out friends from, my college group of improvisers, Random Acts, which I think has 25 year anniversary is coming up, which is crazy. The show's still going on, all student run. Um, but Nice Peter from Epic Rap Battles of History, you know, came out of that show. Me, uh, people who've been on VH1, uh, managers of people on Saturday Night Live. It's just a, a ton of uh, the, the coaches at Second City right now who's on Chicago uh, Fire. Like, out of a college group, we all pulled each other out and then we all shined. We all did the work for five, six, seven years. And we loved every minute of that journey of being in the bars and performing and seeing great performances and just living in that comedy cult lifestyle, <laughs> you know, having nothing, but uh, it was everything to us. So, you know, before I really, we get into your, your career, cause it's so super interesting. I think first I should, <coughs> excuse me. We should talk about what you do now. So, you know, you have your yeah. podcasting empire, you have uh, shows with Vince Russo, you have the the Weed Seeds, you have your own local social media business. So just to give people a brief background of everything, what, you know, what is everything that you do right now? Well, I'm an, I, I'm an all in one producer. So yeah. since, you know, 2000, I've been working as a professional in the digital marketing era and I've taught college classes and and whatnot. So I just said enough of the teaching and enough of working for other people's dime. I really got to invest in myself fully. And I have this skill set that I'm using for other businesses and making good money, uh, you know, comfortable living, but all my creatives going to their product. And that's okay. They're paying me a healthy wage to do it. But uh, you got to take the gamble on yourself of you're only going to get so far there. I could go from here to there, but it's going to take me 10 times the work and be the boss. And I only person I have to answer to is myself. Do I have that in me? And can I build the team and everybody around me? And where can it take me doing deal after deal after a little, which way I want to go and pioneer this uh, area or mine this gem? Is there money here in this? And, and how can I use these models uh, uh, that other people are having success with and apply it to what I do? So you, you get these, and that's what really pumps me up. I get a, an adrenaline rush off of that. Like those, when you find something and it starts to like, oh, we've got something here. And then when you close it and you make the money on it and you do good business on it, man, I just feel like that's what I'm here on this planet to do sometimes, you know, but it, it's all about the, the creative side too. So I need to do the graphics, the video editing, the copywriting, you know, I've been training to do this for 22 years professionally or even not training. I've been 
doing it <laughs> at a very high level. So uh, to do it all in, inside my own uh, brand for Hameen Media Group, uh, you know, and uh, it, it's been a crazy amount of work because <laughs> I have local clients uh, Cooperstown Connection, Ava Tulo Suits. Cooperstown Connection is a, a very cool sports store where they have tons of autographs. They're bring, bringing in Shooter McGavin to do a golf right. tournament. They, uh, what else? Uh, they've got uh, uh, Posada from the Yankees coming in, Jorge Posada to do autograph signings. They have everybody, bro. They, they, they just do awesome, awesome work. And, you know, but that's a different voice for Ava Tulo, a different voice for dipping donuts where I have to post food porn every morning. Like <laughs> you're trying to lose weight and I have to post these delicious donut pictures every day. It's a, it's a, it's funny, but it's a funny torture. Um, yeah. And, and obviously horseshoe genetics.com and this cannabis seed uh, company that I'm invested in, you know, because right now in New York, everything's opening up. And now we have business to consumer and business to business opportunities, business to farm, uh, and maybe even government funds, but all that takes a lot of work, handshakes development. And the podcast is a great way to get to know somebody like you and I are doing right now and say, what can I do for you to help you out? Because you've been loyal to me and, or, you know, or how can we be the pioneers of this and, and get, you know, what you've got going, going forward as well. So that's a, a buzzword in business called synergy. And <laughs> it was super popular like six years ago, but it, it has value. You know, a lot of these buzzwords come and go and branding and all the, all of that was uh, such a popular term. And I don't even know what it is now. There's like T funnels for a while and I'll click funnels and all uh, whatever. And it all goes away. Like it's all just a quick marketing scam. Um, but yeah, man, uh, that, that's really what I'm about with Hameen Media Group to have people who also want to perform or have their own little sidebar show. I give them because of their loyalty, a little piece to grow their own farm on, you know, Matt Schaffer did the entire, uh, South Park suck my balls review, <laughs> you know, uh, GGP does NFO podcast for star Wars. Uh, we have the Star Trek ones as well, a ridiculously random podcast for Ray and Colin. So those guys, it's not like a reward, you know, like I want them to paint with their brushes, get their reps in. And if that's what they love and they can reach an outside audience, then that's more people who are coming to HMG to be part of the community and like-minded people will always find each other and the best will always find each other. And you never know where you're going to pioneer the next or, you know, find the next gem, you know? So it all has a, a good teacher student mentality. And my mom was a teacher her whole career. So I I've taught college classes. So this is just kind of what's in the roots of my DNA, man. And I just apply what I know to try and keep my hustle going and keep the performance buzz going. Yeah, guys, so I should have preferred. So Ben has um, Hameen Media Group, which is like a podcasting network, which yeah. you started a long time ago. Like a lot of people are starting networks now, but you were ahead of the curve on that. I feel <laughs> like you're on, ahead of the curve of a lot of stuff. But um, so yeah. it, it's a lot of uh, podcasts about wrestling. Anyone that knows me knows like I'm a huge wrestling fan. You know, I think there's like five or six of us left, but we're there's still some fans out there. Appreciate um, it. But, uh, but yeah, so you have your Hami Media Group, and then you eventually, like you were just mentioned, you branched out and had these other shows, one about South Park, uh, one about Star Wars. Um, is it all, I forget, is it all behind the paywall? Is any no, those are, those are free shows, and that's why I, I put them out there. And I wanted to keep everything free, and you were, you would were survive through this. But what's happened in technology with censorship you know, uh, that it's really knocked down what my artistic abilities are. So we had to build channelattitude.com to go behind a paywall. But even now, <laughs> we won't go into our coach's content, but censorship occurs even behind the scenes of the stuff that you pay for. So it's like a, a very strange time in podcasting for people who want to have real talk. But for our niche base market of wrestling fans, it's the best wrestling product out there. I think hands down with the real pros, the real inside news, the things that do and don't get said, you know, to help the biz out. And, um, you know, we have great producers, 
who are working with legendary people from Stevie Ray at Harlem Heat to Stevie Richards from the Blue World Order. And we have champions on uh, to do guest spots all the time, man, and the best wrestling pun and community leaders to do watch alongs and all that online. It's all encompassed using everything from Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, you know, and it, it takes a lot of people to row that boat. And, you know, sometimes people got to go for health reasons or professional reasons or family reasons. And I always thank them and leave the door open to do good business. And, and you're always welcome back, especially, you know, some people might be moving across country. They can't be doing podcasts on new Japan. <laughs> like, so I, I, I totally get it. And I'm thankful for the countless hours that they put in on their passion to be part of that crew, but somebody else will step up. If it's spots open and they want to fill it, then let's see what you got, you know, as far as that goes. So um, I've tried to set it up that way where people are responsible. If you're going to hang out with the big dogs, you better deliver. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know? So, and when you don't, and you, that's not a spotlight, I'm not trying to force anybody out, but spotlight's going to be on you. Where's the show <laughs> and guys hop to real quick. And I get it. Some things, just in life happen. That's just how it is. But we try to keep to a great schedule because people are paying for the content because it's so high level for the the people who really love wrestling. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk about that. So you have the free stuff. So like you can go on Apple. Um, I forgot. I used to be subscribed to the HMG feed. Now yeah. I just do Channel Attitude. But so guys, you can check that out. But then you also have um, you're on a couple shows with the wrestler uh, uh, Stevie Richards. He was in every major company if you're a wrestling fan you probably know the name and then you also if you know wrestling you might know vince russo who's like one of the most successful writers no he is the most successful writer <laughs> yeah, in yeah, wrestling the history. controversial the most yeah. successful yeah, the, yeah. And the, the most caring and then one of the nicest guys i know man like in stevie richards you guys go subscribe to his youtube channel right now stevie richards fitness on YouTube, great reviews and uh, all new uh, inspirational shows being developed now and just a, a master of the craft, too, of home production. So thankful to have him as my big brother and mentor and uh, be able to wrestle with him and, uh, you know, a couple times and, and do great, great shows every week. There's no need for him to, aside from our friendship, to dedicate the time that he does to be a part of HMG. But definitely you know all the credibility of any professional in, in any sport stevie richards is great and uh you know looking great he wants you to as well all the stevie richards fitness.com stuff like so glad to be able to help him promote and be a sounding board for him and likewise when it comes to horseshoe genetics and what he drives me to do so uh, um and then uh yeah to work with vince russo bro that's the, that's the weird thing. Like <laughs> I don't need to get into my own karmic states, but like, you know, 20 years ago, I remember saying, dude, I could be the next Vince Russo and bring improv to wrestling. And now I sit across from him and get to improvise with him doing master shoot theater where I imitate Vince McMahon and he imitates Bruce Pritchard, uh, you know, or, or Vince and deuce, I should say. Yeah. And Stevie's right in there. So I'm getting to use all of my skill sets, not just, to do what I wanted to do to help people improve, but to entertain alongside the people that I was absolutely inspired by and fans of before I crossed over behind the curtain and put in my 16 years <laughs> of being on the road and getting, you know, and, and experiencing uh, all these wonderful towns across America and bringing, uh, you know, my character to them to boo and hate and uh, cheer and, and whatever they wanted to do, man. So it's, it's been uh, an unbelievably creative, like ride that a lot of people don't, don't have the ability to dedicate the time to, which I understand. I'm not trying to look down on anybody, but putting in the, that effort and, and wherever I went made moments at OVW Ohio Valley wrestling, which was 
Uh, there's a lot of good schools now, but that was like, the, is the Harvard of professional wrestling. And that was WWE's developmental league. Like I went to Chicago and did six years there at second city and improv Olympic around all the, and now all the people I came up with are doing great work on HBO, you know, on a lot of these comedies uh, and, and whatnot from Silicon Valley to, you know, I can name a, a bunch of them and they're awesome. They're, they're great performers and, you know, the, <laughs> I, I went the wrestling way and we all choose our own way after that. But then from, from that, I went and put in all the time again at OVW to end up directing and writing the show after being trained by Rip Rogers and Al Snow and Danny Davis and just the best in the world uh, and getting to work with all WWE future stars at that point. And from there to CW, when I came back to New York, are the ones who put me in the ring with all those stars to build storylines and build other characters that became, uh, you know, TV personalities as well. It was really the foundation for what AEW is now in the real true underground. But uh, I got to work with them for four years and, and have awesome, like life changing uh, experiences that really established me in this industry. So, yeah, talk about some of the legends because uh, you worked with a lot of legends that people would know. Um, yeah, so I'll like, like talk about that. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who's uh, you know I want to say what's up to Hacksaw, like uh, break a little kayfabe here because he's going through another bout of cancer right now, and he's he's already done it twice and come back clean, but unfortunately it keeps uh, coming back on him in different spots, but. Uh, you know, to get to work with Hacks, I even the Twilight or do a open for stand up. Well, we did a couple of times stand up shows, a great time, you know, legendary. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter, we manage against each other and he tried to get me in the Cobra clutch, but I was pulled free before he could get me. Uh, you know, but to be a G.I. Joe kid in the 80s and now I'm standing in there with Sergeant Slaughter, dude, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Rowdy Roddy Piper, I was one of the last ones. There was a Piper's Pit, I believe, after mine, but uh, on DVD, uh, the, the, one of the last ones to be on Piper's Pit before he passed. And, you know, he whipped me with the belt, and it was just a, a big moment. And uh, Tracy Smothers and a dance-off, uh, you know, in a match. Yeah. That's some, not something I usually do, but uh, I had to break out the moves for the, the legendary Tracy Smothers. And there's just been so many, uh, you know, modern day current wrestlers as well that I've come up with from OVW to get to work with like Eugene and uh, uh, the spirit squad. All those guys were just uh, awesome big brother mentor figures who do this at a higher level than I do it. But uh, you know, I think we all have the same foundation for greatness in our own way. So it's a lot of guys don't even get close to getting those matches on the independence. And I've, I've been, very fortunate and very thankful for the bookers I've had to work with that, that bring in the top talent and, and my heat is there, you know, people have hated it since we invaded Iraq since nine 11 and whatnot. So our gas prices right now, they got to blame somebody. So blame me. So when I get beat, they feel a little bit better driving home. So it's been uh it's been quite an unbelievable career and now people pay me five dollars to slap them across the face so yeah. Yeah, video, you, where are the videos you can I literally watch people yeah. pay you five dollars to slap yeah. them in the face but where are these on your facebook or your instagram uh, they haven't been banned from youtube there's some on my instagram at hacker hameen but uh youtube uh you can just go five dollar face slap ben hameen and there's about 22 of them on there i think right now but i think we're up to 55 uh, total. So there's some hidden away. I want to figure out how to make them into NFTs. That's my next hustle is the, the tournament of that, where you can own the $5 face slap master. Uh, so, yeah. So we should have also prepping that you play a bad guy and you obviously you're so good at it that people yeah. are paying you to smack them in the face, which is a good way to earn a living. You're a big <laughs> dude, right? You're like, are you like six, five or six, three? Yeah, I'm, I'm about six three, six four, uh, depending on uh, how my back's feeling that day. Uh, but yeah, man, uh, I'm you know son of a <laughs> lumberjack and farm boy, and I play you know uh, Bin Laden uh, style Sultan uh, Prince of Sod, man, and uh, it all is political, everything tied in and and whatnot. And I just started that as a carnival barker bit to try and get people to come either buy an eight by ten 
but you know, I was like, I'll discipline your child, bring them over here to, and, you know, pick up all the poops off the, from the dog off the front lawn. And they're like, you know, like just to scare the little kid or, or what have you, or I'll slap you and you'll grow a full head of hair tomorrow, moron, to any bald guy that goes by. Like, so they hate <laughs> me later I, when I come out or if I'd already been out and uh, just a little improv with the crowd to go back and forth. And, and then I saw these guys, uh, Davy Richards and Eddie Edwards, the American wolves chopping fans after a show and like blistering them. Wow. And I, and like, just cause they wanted to see, take a chop from those guys to their marks. I go, you should charge 20 bucks for that, bro. So I started doing the $5 face slap and I didn't think anybody would ever step up. And then some of these super fans that are crazy, that just want to be part of the show, step up. And <laughs> now if you want to talk about the performance art of it, we're walking a very fine line, but I get it all on camera. And, um, you know, if they, <laughs> they, they want to pay to get hit. I mean, there's guys who pay a lot more to women for a little slap and tickle $5 is a, is a, is a cheap, uh, you know, uh, freshener across the face, but they're, they're shocked when they feel how hard it is. I got pretty big paws on me and, uh, and, uh, I don't hold back, man, <laughs> not even a little bit. And it's all, it, uh, if you go on YouTube, type, uh, type in Bin Hameen, it's all documented too. Like I've seen, you can watch Ben's matches on there. You can watch them smack people for fun. So definitely make sure you go on YouTube for that. Yeah. There's plenty of my content out there, crazy promos and, and old shows of, uh, you know, from Hameen media group before we changed some things around. So, yeah, whatever. There's a lot of content out there. My YouTube channel, Ben Hameen. I think I got about seventeen and a half thousand subscribers. So let's get to twenty thousand. And uh, and there's plenty of uh, old school matches where you can see me unathletically uh, try and do moves and then just kick the shit out of people. So. Yeah, but I, I definitely want to talk about channel attitude. So you have your Hameen Media Group, which is you know free. Free content's always good, but to get paid for your stuff is also got to be super fulfilling. And I think a lot of people, yeah. a lot more people probably could get paid for their content. Um, so you're also involved, you know, we were talking about Vince Russo. Um, so those that don't know, he used to write for The Rock and Stone Cold. Like basically the Attitude Era, which is like the height of wrestling in the WWF, WWE. Vince Russo wrote all that stuff. And he has his podcast network called Channel Attitude. Um, I think it's only like four or five bucks a month, I think. I don't, I don't even remember. I subscribe. Okay. I don't remember. But so you're, you know, you have you host shows with Vince and Stevie and then you have your own um, stuff, your Hami media group on there. That's paid for as well. Right. Right. Absolutely. And not, with like Netflix, we haven't raised the price on you. So <laughs> right. yeah, my HMG is $5 and so is a uh, channel attitude, but I am, I am on both. However, one is my brand, you know right. what I mean? So we have on Hami media group, the locker room series, which is where we run down the dirt sheets at the beginning and the end of the week. Cause you never know who's going to kill somebody in a car accident or walk out and leave the belts on the desk. And yeah. <laughs> uh, so between uh, who's going to interrupt the news cycle next, um, you know, so we, we break all that down. Plus all the wrestling shows throughout the week, impact NXT SmackDown rampage, and uh in aew dynamite so we we have the, the the most hours put in watching wrestling and then we have special shows for the new japan stuff and whatnot if we have those types of things available so it's all the wrestling content that you could ever want and in vince russo side i do the smackdown review and the raw review so we don't really need to cover that at hmg you know they're, they're there and that's with stevie and vince uh, and we have a good time goofing on each other and coming up with, you know, I get to sit there and punch up raw. Like they should have done this with Vince Russo, you know, like so to me, it's like, okay, this is some weird, you know, karmic fantasy that, uh, 20 years ago I put in the ethosphere and here we are in a, in a weird way where I didn't envision it like that, but who cares? We're here. Uh, and, and, you know, that's paid content too. And then we also have Patreons. I haven't been too active on mine, but uh, I do Master Shoot Theater uh, on Vince's where we do talk, uh, you know, some heavier conspiracy stuff. And then we get to improvise and rib on WWE office and we have a hell of a good time doing it. And it's a, a constant episodic series, which is them trusting to do the long form improv that I learned in Chicago without them completely understanding it. And 
I lead them along the way. And sometimes they make brilliant moves that astound me and make me laugh that are way above. They do it. And sometimes they don't know that they even do it. So it's a, it's a great, great uh, experience for me every week creatively, man. And, you know, it's, it's awesome hearing the story of the full circle of how you used to want to do what Vince does and be Vince. And now you're working with him. Uh, I know like Stevie, you guys met just through wrestling, right? But how did you, how did you link up with Vince and join channel attitude? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, big Sal uh, from FBI, big Sal Graziano, uh, my, my dude, everyone. Shout loves. out big Sal. Yeah. Shout out big Sal forever, dude. I love big <laughs> Sal so much. Um, he and I just had a great friendship at, at OVW and would make each other laugh so hard, dude. And, um, then, you know, just through using the internet when, after moving around and separating and Sal and I would share conspiracy things, UFO, Bigfoot stuff that we like, you know, giants, uh, which Sal is a giant. And yeah, uh, so it sounds like, so those that don't know, he's like literally seven foot tall, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's my own personal giant. Uh, <laughs> and he's hilarious and brilliant. Um, but, uh, he, him and Stevie were buddies from ECW. So, we just kind of got put into a group chat, <laughs> me and Stevie and, and GGP and, and Sal. And then we formed the Conspiracy Horseman and did that run for three years and just had uh, incredible guests and, and fun shows and talking how wrestlers look at everything as a work and breaking it down that way. And it was, it was, it was ahead of its time. Like you said, almost all my ideas, you could, you could stamp that on every idea I have ahead of its time, <laughs> ahead of its time, pretty much. Uh, and, uh, Stevie and I uh, just ended up becoming friends and doing podcasts together. And then we met to go do wrestling shows together as the conspiracy horseman. And then Vince was looking for someone to help cover, uh, the raw and SmackDown review. Cause I believe Kenny Bolin and Vito, uh, were having an issue. So that ended kind of whatever. And we came on there and we were off to the races and Vince kind of, I became his uh, his crush, I think, real quick because he wanted to get inside my brain and see what it was about. But we've just had awesome, fun laughs and and became great bros. And I got to go out to Colorado to Mo Rocky Mountain Pro and perform there. And I got to meet with Vince out there. And I think we might do something here with Cooperstown Connection because he's such a huge baseball fan. Uh, you know, I can give him a world class tour of Cooperstown where the Hall of Fame is. And my client there, seventh inning stretch has the most unbelievable store with baseball history and autographs everywhere. So it, we, we may do something here down the road in the near future as well together. So it, it's been a, a more of a digital business relationship, but that's the beauty of this technology of connecting with people uh, through podcasts, videos like this and being able to reach a new audience and, help sprinkle those seeds, man. You never know what's going to grow on that farmland. Yeah. You know, now I think about it, you're chopping a lot of wood and carrying a lot of water because you have, your, <laughs> you have your own, you have your own network and that's what the, those shows like there's a show a day, right? Like five. Seven, yeah. <laughs> I do nine shows a week plus manage five local clients uh, every day. So, <laughs> and you're wrestling on the weekends still and, and wrestling on the weekends. And, um, looking for new business always. So like, that's just what it is to kind of stay afloat right now. I'm really at 90, close to 90 hours a week, seven days a week I work, you know, but are you really working when it's, okay, let me create these graphics. Let me create this giveaway. Let me get more followers. Oh, that turned into a sale. Now, how can I upsell or resell? Or how can I take this model and apply it to a new client? because I know they're super busy setting up their business and I can alleviate this from them. Like that's, that's my bread and butter locally. It takes so much to run any business for people to not be able to do Facebook and Instagram and that stuff. It just slips through the cracks when it's one of the most important things that they can do, you know? So that's where I was like, how can I use my skills to offer this service? And I've repeated that across multiple different men's clothing, sports, food you know cannabis industry now yeah i love hearing uh on the show that you talk about how you leverage you know the wrestling stuff with your local clients and mm -hmm. how you use you mix the two um that's super smart business so and that's kind of your podcast too you can leverage that stuff too so 
you, you know, I, I don't. That. I do a little bit to put them over, like dipping donuts. We have the 24 seven champion, 24 seven dipping donuts championship uh, at uh, Immortal Championship Wrestling. And now horseshoe genetics.com and Marshall's Hydroponics is also, and Ava Tulo are all sponsors of Immortal. Um, so those shows can uh, pay for the, insurance in the house and we can keep ticket prices where they are and, and make sure our audience are getting a great show. And those businesses are getting a shine as like this. We we're a group of local business people who want success together. And we need to build these little bonds and coalition to get things going forward. And if somebody else wants to come in, yeah, hey, come in, dude, what can we do to help everybody all the way around? And uh, it, it that's, don't want to bury Horowitz myself, but like that's when you see those opportunities, you need to make sure that that happens as well. So, um, I don't know. My dad's woodsman show to go back to it is also a big timber industry show. So I've seen a lot of companies work together and how it, what it takes to get them set up to shine. So I think I took that part of that and kind of applied it to this because if you're trying to do it all yourself and you just feel like nobody's got your back as opposed to like, oh, okay, a little of this pressure's off because they're doing it too. And this seems to be the way forward. That's always a better way in business, man. So I, I try and set those opportunities up as well, but you got to do all the legwork to make them viable clients in order to get that stuff done. You know? Yeah. You know, I used to um, work with a lot of doing digital marketing stuff. I work with local businesses and a lot of real estate agents and I, I used to tell them all the time, you need to like become a cornerstone in the community and you do that through digital marketing and social media and stuff. And that's pretty, I think that's why I like what you say, because that's what you do is you're, you know, you're making them known in the community. <clears throat> you know, like I, I've heard you talk about, you can pick up tickets for the wrestling show at your client's business. So right. You know, <laughs> so now right. you're giving them foot traffic, right? And if you're going into dipping donuts, to buy tickets there ain't no way you're walking out of there without a donut there's just no way <laughs> yeah. you know but marshall's hydroponics is a new store and people are a little bit sketched out of like in new york of like did somebody say weed like they're all popping up like we're trying to change the stigma you know of what things are and this is a billion dollar industry to, so to get people in the door is very cool to see the plant growing and stuff like that you know and uh uh, it, it was it was a, a a good little cross promotion that way, and we'll bring our champions in, Kayla Sparks and Chip Stetson, and do meet and greets and and whatnot because they are the stars that we want to shine. They they are they work hard behind the scenes, and uh, they they do as much on social media to help the immortal brand with Kayla being on SmackDown and at Backlash, and she was at WrestleMania, and she's our champ. She's a, a perfect poster girl to keep that shine going on immortal to gain more followers. So it's all looking at things with a keen eye and sometimes creative needs to change based on the, the return that you're getting. So I love playing all these little micro aspects of the chess game, almost against myself to see where we can capitalize on things. Yeah. And I'm sure the business owners, they love being involved with that stuff. Cause it just, it, it's fun and it makes them like seem like a bigger deal. Not that they're not a big deal, but it kind of, you're making them, celebrities in the area they should they should be honored as a big deal it takes yeah. a lot to run any business especially a brick and mortar storefront business you know and ones that specialize like cooperstown connection if you go in there like the stuff they have signed by al pacino to you know they even have john Gotti uh autograph on a letter and stuff joe montana the tom brady like unbelievable stuff on and you're just like wow and it can be in your home that's a, that's an uh, a not an easy thing to sell like you have to find the right clientele like they have great jerseys and you want shot glasses with your favorite teams on you can get all that stuff too but they've got a muhammad ali joe frazier mike tyson autographs you know the, the karate kid like it's it's unreal and then ava tulo suits you can get a suit a beautiful jacket there for 200 bucks but you can also get a custom tailored four thousand dollars suit if you want, you know. So it, it, there's there's a, a, a such a, a wide berth of clientele, but then everybody loves dipping donuts. It doesn't matter who it is or how much money you do or don't have. You want those donuts in your coffee in the morning. So it's very interesting uh, to switch those voices and how can we create opportunity 
all together with these crazy wrestling world that kind of brings everyone together. That's the beautiful thing of the strange and crazy world of pro wrestling. Doesn't matter if you're Canadian, Mexican, in Japan, in the UK, in America, you're, you're in this weird cult of wrestling fans that love the escapism, that love the staged violence, that love the laughs, that love the carpet pulled out from under them. And it's something that the human spirit and condition can relate to. So how can we use that as our platform to do other good business, whether it's charity work, you know, I mean, they'll hate that I say this, they don't like to be outed for this stuff, but Marshall's hydroponics with their sponsorship got free tickets. Boom. They went right to the police, uh, to give to a family that they know wouldn't be able to afford something like that, but it's not like they want to be shined for that. You know what I mean? I'm like, we don't put that kind of stuff uh, on the marquee, but that's the give back to the community opportunity that is above and beyond that any dollar can make. You know, you did something for a kid who might not have that by creating those other opportunities. So uh, th that's really where the payoff usually is. It's nice to make money though, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever you give, you get back. I believe too. I think you believe that too. So it makes sense. I try. I keep uh, trying to do the right thing, man. You know, it, when you have the opportunity to go above and beyond, if it's not going to cost you much or anything aside from being friendly and making the right choice and a little hard work, so be it. And, you know, I don't know if you're still doing these other businesses, but, you know, just because I've been listening to you for over the years, you know, you guys had your, you were doing a coffee brand for a little bit. I know you're working with the olive oil company. So I feel like a lot of this has just come from being a content creator and just the hard work and pounding the pavement. Dude, he just dropped off coffee on my front porch this morning. Uh, cause I hooked him up with some horseshoe genetic seeds, but, uh, yeah, the brosters.com, a local, unbelievable coffee. He's li literally my backdoor neighbor. I didn't even know it for like the first two years. We were even working together. Uh, oh, wow. and he, they did an official Vince Russo bro limited edition coffee, but, uh, I like the medium roast Nicaraguan blend, but, uh, they just redid their packaging. It looks awesome. But the brosters.com, well, that was a great local partnership and some things aren't going to go on forever they might be a short run you know and then zordosoliveoil.com is an offshoot of uh dip and donuts it's their own family they're very greek pride family but their their family has orchards in greece so they get ultra premium grade olive oil pressed they've had it tested uh by all the food companies and they're like this meets ultra premium grades you have to have it tested to be able to say that so for like you know the the foodies in your life or, you know, anybody uh, that loves cooking, you know, those big holiday meals, you want it to taste better than ever, ZornosOliveOil.com. It's a, a ultra premium product. So little things that I might set up a project for, uh, you know, that can kind of take care of themselves afterwards. There's all those small short-term opportunities and who are my long-term clients and how can I repeat those successes once I've sold them my product or answered a solution for their product more importantly that they needed that they didn't have time to complete. Yeah. You know, I think it is with entrepreneurs because that's mainly who I interview and my audience is you have the skill set and this desire within, and you can just apply it to anything in life. Once you have that skill set of chopping water and or chopping wood and carrying water, like yeah. you're able to just apply that to every aspect of your life, especially your business. Absolutely. And also the other part of that from my, my old man that was instilled is you're, even if you're the leader, you're no better than anybody else. You have to learn how to follow, uh, before you can lead. And if you're not going to get down there in that ditch and dig that hole with the guy right next to you, you're not going to stand there while he's b breaking his back and you look over his shoulder and go, yep, you're doing a good job. No, nope, there's a shovel there. You get down there and you dig too, if that's what it calls for. So, uh, so, you know, and, and your followers will respect you more when they see that, you know, like, should I be taking bumps at my age? <laughs> Maybe not, but it, that is part of what makes my brand credible still, you know what I mean? So, uh, you, you got to do that part of it to, to, to keep your, I don't know, I, maybe I don't at this point, but the legacy and the credibility of it, you know, having Stevie, having Vince, that's all the credibility I really need anymore. So, uh, and, and the fact that we've built this awesome thing together. So I think the leadership side of it's important too, 
but I never want to be one of those people. That's why I do all these shows every week. And, and it's not to be like, ha, look how much I do. It's like somebody looks at them and, and they can't get one done while well, I did five. Like, okay, what, what's, what's the issue? You know, I'm not trying to single anybody out. I'm not talking about anybody on my team, but like, right. Generally, yeah, yeah. Right. Like no one's going to be able to step to you and be like, well, you didn't do anything. Well, I was in Jamaica. That's, what, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's how I try and lead my team. So, so they're impressed with my work ethic that they'll step up and do it. Big Ray's a great example of that. Colin Y song, Al Plaza, these guys on my team, because they're ready to go even at a moment's notice if I need something to show that they're busting their ass too, man. So th that hard work is inspiring and that work ethic of chop wood, carry water is at the foundation of probably almost everything I do. Yeah. And it shows that's for sure. Um, but yeah. So as, as we start to wrap it up, you know, I got to ask some more wrestling questions because I love wrestling, Everyone. but I'm super, I'm super curious. What are your early? So I'm, I'm, I'm 35. I know what are you, you're 40, you're 45, 44. I'll be 45 this summer, man. <laughs> so yeah. for me, it was, um, you know, the early nineties, you know, Shawn Michaels, early undertaker, but I'm curious, uh, what was your early memories of wrestling growing up? Like what got you hooked into wrestling? Well, that's a, so I know I keep going back. I'm glad to talk about my dad always, but he was a, a varsity champ who went undefeated and wrestled for Paul Smith as well. Well, he got defeated in the finals by a dude from New York city. Uh, you know, but, uh, he looked like a 40 year old when he was 18 and he was a bit like, you see the wrestling pictures. So people in my town would always be like, your dad was a beast. No one could beat him. Da 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 da. You know, big farm boy. And kind of like a Brock Lesnar type at the time. And, uh, and, uh, he, at the time WWF was just taken off like 83. You know what I mean? When people will come up and tell you when you can remember when you're six years old and yeah. my dad's friends are all these huge lumberjacks, bro. Like my dad's buddies look like hillbilly Jim, like almost every one of them, like <laughs> these huge guys and they're all characters with their own names too. And I'm on the pro lumberjack circuit all summer long, you know, with this guy and that guy with tiny and, you know, Dickie and all these guys. And, and, and it's, it's crazy. They're as big a character as what I see on TV, but all these people are telling my, tell me how my dad was this badass. So I just equated in my little kid mind that pro wrestling is what my dad did, you know? And, um, but then I learned as he put me in wrestling class that <laughs> it was far different amateur wrestling. Yeah. But he, he, my mom made me take, make him take me when I was eight years old, the Saturday night main event in Syracuse. And, um, we were standing there seventh row, right against the gate. And Andre, the giant came down during Hogan versus killer con. And Andre had this terrible lime green su seer sucker suit on, but he stopped right next to me and my dad. And like, my dad's a larger than life dude for a little guy and then andre standing right next to him dude and i just remember the size of andre's hands and i was just like that i remember that moment in time so vividly and since i was eight years old i haven't missed a week of wrestling in my life <laughs> but like maybe because of power outages like five times in the history of raw or whatever you know during uh shitty weather but uh really man like to to, to go a week without wrestling and I'd, I'd like to, I guess maybe when I'm in Jamaica, but even then I usually end up watching something because I'm running hot mean media group. I haven't missed a week of wrestling. So it's a, it's a weird sickness and, and everybody yeah. has their art, but that's what it is, man. What really changed me and it, the, the whole attitude era and everything, all that was just such a, a, a high, a high point of the art form, even if it was blue humor or, you know, fantasy stuff or dark stuff, you know, or sexy stuff. Like we were pushing our boundaries and, and it saddens me now in 2022 to not have that 97 mentality or to have the 97 mentality and have the 2022 censorship over what you can do and not be canceled. And the people who were supposed to be the most open-minded have made this playing field, the most closed off and the most, compacted without free thought and without pushing the boundaries of bad taste. I think that's what censor anti-censorship, how far can we push the boundaries and bad taste and then even take it farther? But I don't know, man, it's, 
it, it's frustrating as a as a artist who's dedicated their life to entertaining you know since i was 12 years old i've been performing really professionally yeah man like i um i just i love wrestling i i fell out for a long time but um i think like 2005 2010 i stopped watching and mm. cm punk kind of brought me back in with the infamous pipe bomb but i feel <laughs> like you know not that i don't feel bad for people who don't get wrestling but I, it's like I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's just, there's nothing better than really good wrestling. You know, <laughs> it's escapism. It's, uh, it's sports. It's, it's how it's really the fact that you can't explain it is a good thing because that means our psychology of how we're taking you on a ride and, and making the energy kind of flow from us to you because you're watching what we're doing and the rhythm. That's what really speaks to, uh, connecting with the audience through the art form and it, the fact that you don't know is us kind of protecting the magic people know words and they know shine heat come back but if you don't know how to work inside of those parameters in kind of a bruce lee formless form jake kundo kind of way where we all know the way that we're gonna go but the way I mix my sauce is different than the way you do when we put them together and if it's done the right way where we take care of each other and the rhythms there it just so, something magical happens to the energy in the room. And sometimes you can build up legacies where you don't even need to touch. And that moment is the most powerful moment in the entire arena match or on the card, the rock Hogan in Toronto. I was there live. I've never seen or experienced anything like that in my life in any rock concert. It can happen naturally in sports, like it's especially the end of this NFL season with some of the Bills games and those back and forth unbelievable finishes. Like it can happen naturally, but if you set up the creative and wrestling the right way and you play to the height of the characters and the audience's intelligence, you can get them there if you tell the right long term story on almost every level. A match can have one of those moments. If you build it the right way, uh, they will come. <laughs> yeah, really, it really is an art form. It really is magic. Um, hmm. And I feel like I just personally learned a lot. Like, this might sound weird, but I've learned a lot, a ton from wrestling. You know, between the psychology and the, the video editing and the marketing and the storytelling, like, there's just so many elements. You're, you know, like you mentioned, having a sauce. Like, it is a sauce. There's a recipe. There's so many elements that goes into it. And, um it's just funny to me when my buddies still rip on me for watching it. Like, oh, you still watch that stuff? And it's like, man, you just don't get it. You know, that's what I always say. Like, yeah. And it might not be for everybody now yeah. in the way things are done. And, and we might look back upon it fondly as creatures of habit for what it used to be and find enjoyment in it and escapism to our inner child. There's all that weird Freudian psychology in there as well. But, uh, you know, if you like it, then – you know the moments that are coming even if it's usually a bad build to wrestlemania it usually delivers to some oohs and ahs and and like oh i like that and i escaped and and i had my little fantasy for a minute and now i gotta go back to the real world but the the dark side and mafia side of wrestling and the worker side and the creating the fantasy can really open people's eyes to the marketing of the world and politics and whatever it is like it can shine a light on there and be like, I seen, I seen this storyline before <laughs> this is as phony as wrestling. Well then, yeah, it is. It can really teach you a lot about the the world around you. And if, if it's your escape, then uh, it can get you out of feeling a certain way for a minute by believing or living vicariously through big, larger than life characters, whether it's somebody whose body you emulate or a girl that you want to date or, uh, somebody who makes you laugh, you know, because of uh, their witticism. So there, there's all these Baskin Robbins 31 flavors, and hopefully we play the characters that we're given to the height of our audience's intelligence to provide them with the best show possible. Unfortunately, people take breaks for five years because we failed to do that a lot of times. They just became cookie cutter and lost a lot of people when we have the opportunity to do it at a Shakespearean level, if we really wanted to, you know, and sometimes they try, but they just don't know how to pull it off for some reason. I know how to pull it off. <laughs> it's Yeah. It's funny. It's like re really good wrestling is really good, but really bad wrestling. is just like horrible. Like, you know, yeah, dude. 
Like if I show a fr- if I try to show a friend wrestling, I can't show them certain stuff because they'll never think about it again. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like not every flavor of ice cream you're not gonna you're not gonna like them all. You know, you might not like rum raisin ever, and uh, some people hate mint chip. <laughs> yeah. you, might, you might hate the, you know what is that on the card is that uh you know some goofy 24 7 title spot that makes wrestling super phony is it the anime japanese girls match that nobody wants to <laughs> see where they're they're just you know playing wrestler and it's not really anything but some, for somebody that might be what they like but for the rest of the 98 percent, they want to see the oohs and ahs the larger than life the guys with the super gassed up muscles, the guys who can do the crazy flips, the luchadors. There's all these little spots on the show where if we shine in women's wrestling, that if we shine it the right way and we build to it, it can be the top draw on the ticket seller, you know, but everybody's got to know what part they need to play inside the card. And a true master of running an organization will take all those and build the roller coaster ride of drama for the audience with faster matches, slower matches, high flyers, a feature this way that takes them on that experience of highs and lows, but they don't even realize that that's being done to them. They're just there to enjoy the show. But at the end, they're almost left breathless because someone who knows how to put a card together. So they say what a booker is. It's not just putting matches together in long-term business. It's creating that entire experience. Yeah, you're right. The best those are the best matches are the roller coasters where they like might start off fast and then they slow down and the crowd dies down a little bit. Then they build the crowd back up. Like, well, man. there's roller. It's a roller coaster within a roller coaster. Each match should do that as well, but the entire show should do that in the way that it, it's all booked as well, dude. And then people are leaving going, "That was awesome, man! Every segment was awesome." Like, yes, I know. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I designed it to be that way. Um, well, I think a great last question is I'm curious what your um your first professional match. I'm curious how that went and where it was and who you wrestled because you've been doing it for so long, but that was like your first one. So I'm curious the story behind your first match. Well, uh <laughs> first match like on the road that people paid tickets to see yeah. me would have been at, at OVW. Um, the first thing I ever did uh was on TV. There's a security, but I came out and did a pull apart between Paul Burchill and uh, Damian Sandow, Aaron, the idol Stevens and got knocked out. Uh, <laughs> then, then about, uh, about uh, four or five months after that, after training, they put us all together uh, as the insurgency, Ali and Omar Akbar and myself and later Turk, John Chellick and Serena Deeb. Um, but uh, I think probably it was a, it was probably just a house show someplace where I got, called i i should know this i really don't even know like what was my first match like what we built to i guess my first biggest match was called uh shave in the cage uh you know uh where i had to face dean hill and they shaved my beard at the end so that was me kind of leaving the territory but i would usually in ovw i was the manager so i would get caught in spots so in flag matches when my guys got knocked out by Rob Conway and Pat Buck, I would try and climb and get the flag. And then they catch me and give me the big Ric Flair toss off or, you know, so I was usually getting my hand caught with my caught with my hand in the cookie jar. And then I get smashed by uh, Los Locos or somebody like that, or the mobile homers. So me being in a match usually didn't happen until, uh, you know, it was a big payoff where people wanted to see me get my butt kicked. But I think it's online shave in the cage. Uh, you can see that one. Uh, one of my early, early day matches, man. Yeah. I'm going to put that in my browser and look later. So <laughs> I'm curious because not a lot of people. So OVW is like a de- de- developmental territory for right. WWF back in the day, but who like that stuff's not really online, right? I don't know. They don't really release. Yeah. Stuff, do <laughs> I've, I've got a fair amount of it online. Uh, I don't know. Danny sold it to the company. So it's a weird thing. Like copyright wise, I guess uh, they could go at me now if they want to, but I try and help out with all their marketing. So I'm OVW loyal, but like I was there when WWE left. So Danny sold the library to WWE, but it only goes to 2007, uh, 2007, 2008. I was there 2006 to 2009 
and what I wrote was 2008 to 2009. So should I have rights to what I wrote, I guess is what it comes down to. And does anybody care? Now there are WWE stars on there, but that's not what they bought. So everything going forward belongs to Danny still, but Danny sold it to, I think Al Snow. And I don't know the, the, the these other radio guys in Kentucky. So that early stuff is kind of out there that that's in this weird ethosphere and I think it does good work to show OVW for how awesome it, it was even then, man. And uh, you see plenty of people that uh, became top stars uh, in those videos as well. So, yeah. So, um, were, you, were you there like when Brock Lesnar and John Cena and stuff were there, or that was before you? That was a bit before me. I mean, Brock came back and we did show together, and you know, Cena did a show at Six Flags, and he actually wanted to work. He saw us. And he wanted to work us, but we have been, he wanted to, he asked Danny Davis to switch his match. And Danny goes, Nope, because it was 4th of July and we were working a flag match against Pat Buck and Rob Conway, the Iron Men, in a big payoff. But Cena wanted to give me the FU because Cena came out on a Humvee with 12 Marines on 4th of July. Oh, there's wow. the, there's the terrorists stirring. Right. You got you know, the terrorist. Yeah, yeah. Right. But Danny shut down John Cena. That's dude. That's how hardcore Danny Davis is. Like this is when Cena was at his peak too. Like wow. Danny's like nah. <laughs> like so, and and I, not that I was offended because I'm getting to work Rob Conway, who's a phenomenal wrestler who I learned a ton from, and Pat Buck, who's obviously uh, works for AEW now, and you've seen him in WWE. So uh, you know a lot of great talent in that ring. Uh, in my moment, but people were expecting me to get messed over. But later that next summer, I get Mr. Sockoed by Mick Foley and stuff like that. So I've, I've gotten to have these unbelievable moments just to be on a show with Cena, you know, you're just like, okay, yeah, it, that's the magic of OVW. And what we try and bring to wherever else I work to CW would have dream booking, you know, where you're like, Hey, it's uh Kevin Steen versus Terry Funk tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, like you're on that, you're on that show. Oh, all right. You know, and I might be doing something smaller with Dick Justice, but we'd still have our moment, and that would lead to what we were gonna do with Roddy Piper in three months. So small breadcrumbs along the way, man. You'll get full at the end. There's no doubt about it. Every story's gonna have its crescendo, and, and the guys who worked hard are gonna get the payoff. Uh, that they deserve by working the top guy who's going to shine them, you know, like that's what we do in this business or what we should be doing. You know, I have to ask one more question because I, they live is my favorite movie. Probably, probably my favorite movie ever. Roddy Piper is just the man. Um, so I'm curious what, you know, what did you learn from working with him or did he teach you anything directly? Like what was that experience like? Well, it was magical. Like we were just there for that uh, weekend, you know, and to be, I had already worked with hacksaw and, uh, slaughter and like foley and you know a lot of guys like joy mercury helped me keep a cool head and being a rip rogers guy don't be a mark for yourself all that shit so i can carry myself pretty well and i was an older guy so in my gimmick you don't have to do a lot except punch kick you know and be vicious so they like that because we can do a lot going around the ring and they're not going to take a slam or anything like that you know they those guys are always going to win uh, over evil even if he was evil. But um, so the first night I didn't work with him, but the, I knew we smartened him up to what we were doing where I had kidnapped Jessica Havoc and Dick Justice was looking for and is ongoing in our feud. So we did the Piper's pit and it kind of fell flat, but we get to the back and uh, like he had knocked me out and stuff with the stick and whatnot. And we, he beats me to the back uh, and, and off we go and he hits Dick justice and he goes, he's like, did you guys feel that? Like, I was like, eh, it's a little flight. He's like, you want to go out? I go, sure. He grabs me and we just call on the fly and out we go. And he throws me in and takes the belt and starts whipping me and they're on the ring and the crowd comes up and we, we got it back together in that moment. But you know, I, I he hit me a couple times, but this is wrestling. When you're in the ring, you don't feel nothing. And but you hear people go, Oh, you're like, now we got them. Now we gave them their money's worth, you know? So even in a scene that fell a little bit uh, uh, under where we wanted to, and like <laughs> we were, we were face to face at one point, and this is when he did the wife swap show with uh, Ric Flair. So I put over Ric Flair's wife and I said, no one will want a little, 
a wife like yours that looks like a little boy and he got shoot hot and like pulled my head you know gear off and, and he's looking face to face and he goes i shouldn't have done that and then like he, i got him hot enough to do that to like approach me in the moment but like if he was to really do that i gotta now i gotta lay him out you know what i mean i had to kind of sit there and take it and he apologized to me later for it. i was like dude who cares in the scene i really don't but kissed me on my head told me i did a wonderful job just being there for everything and you know whether he was working me or not man he was a, he was a lovely dude to me and uh was gone soon after that but uh to get the praise of legends and to know that i've never really hurt one of these guys and we've been able to draw money together and and do this kind of stuff where i can keep their legacy alive through my character and and pay that heat off and the crowd goes nuts for them that's that's all i could ever ask for man getting to work with my childhood childhood heroes bro I'll, yeah I, i'm eight years old watching andre the giant and piper is probably on that show you know yeah. I, I mean i remember strike force dropped the belts uh or won the belts did they i can't remember off the top of my head uh but uh to to power and glory but you know that that was just like a marquee moment in my life and now i get to earn the respect of these legends and People are like, don't mark out for wrestlers and, and whatnot. But yeah, dude, I, I got that eight by 10 with me and Piper sells three to one what the rest of mine do. So I still make money off that moment, you know, like uh, people want it. They like it. It's recognizable. And Mike Mondo taught me that. He goes, Sheik, he goes, see that one of me in the spirit squad? And I go, yeah. He goes, see that one of me getting kicked in the face by Shawn Michaels? He goes, I sell that one 10 to one of me getting kicked in the face. <laughs> I, go, yeah. I go, he goes, you got awesome pictures. Get them done up. So I put the ones out there with from the cover of Living on the Edge, and I put the ones out there with Piper, bro, and make money. So I'm thankful to Piper, bro. He makes me money even now. You know, so it, it, it's uh, it's great to know that in my little stupid world of pro wrestling, I got to live these moments and it might not have been in a WWE ring, but I don't care because, uh, you know, I got to I got to live it and get the respect of my peers. That's awesome, man. Well, this so this has been easily the longest interview I've done. So <laughs> I think I think I've released like nine, but this is like the 13th or 14th I recorded, but. You know, I could talk to you. I listen to you talk about wrestling all day, but I could talk to you about wrestling all day. Um, so I really appreciate you taking out the time. Um, and, you know, I probably we probably should have had you start this as you're not that you're not in character, but in <laughs> wrestling mode. So what I was going to say is I want to give you your opportunity to promote everything you got going on. So maybe you could do that if you want to in your Ben Hameen voice. Yeah, if you want, if you want to. <laughs> Finally, I don't have to do your stupid CIA characters that they make me do all the time. Now I can get back to how I really sound, styling like these moron Americans all the day. But you can check out Hameen Media Group officially at channelattitude.com. Infidels, the hottest wrestling talk. Nothing held back. I'll cut you down. But if you're over, I might just put you over. <laughs> and that's right. If you want to get your cannabis garden growing, that's right. All of your states smoke your marijuana because I don't care where it is. We're shipping at uh, horseshoegenetics.com, infidels. All of your favorite cannabis strains are there now at horseshoegenetics.com. And join online in your Facebooks because you don't have any friends. Look at you. You're a pathetic moron infidel. So go on Facebook, Hameen Media Discussion Group for all the watch-alongs, all the pick em challenges, all the pick-your-nose challenges, and then go watch every promo and $5 face slap on Bin Hameen YouTube channel. Subscribe, do all of that, and maybe come to a show and bring $5 because you need a face slap too, moron. Y'all law. HMG, Ben Hameen, over strong on coaches and content infidels. Zach Shull, you've just been crushed. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Ben Hameen. Cameo.com slash Ben Hameen. Y'all law. <laughs> Y'all law, infidels. That's where we're going to end it because you can't top that. That was the best outro on this podcast. So I appreciate Ben for doing this, and I appreciate you guys for watching and listening. I'm going to have links to all his stuff in the description. So like he said, if you want to start growing your own weed, which you can start doing in a lot of different areas. If you want to get slapped in the face for $5, we'll get you links to all that stuff. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode.